A suspected accused, a suspect accused in the invasion of the residence of justice, Odili, points fingers at the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, who has denied it. And the world powers take steps to court cabin emission in cities across Africa, Asia and Latin America. The big question is, is Nigeria ready to cut those emissions? This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Ann Nicole. The Nigeria Police High Command has arrested 14 suspects who raided the home of Supreme Court George Justice Odili. Police spokesman uh, Frank Mba, who paraded the suspects, said seven of them, including two soldiers, are at large. He vowed that all suspects uh, at large would be apprehended. Mba noted that the leader of the illegal operation is a fake chief superintendent of police. One of the suspects, Lawrence Ajaro, had said that he was a consultant engaged by the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, he, uh, and that he is not a police officer, as he had claimed to be. Now, the um, Attorney General has denied this, describing Ajoda's claim as a case of a drowning man scavenging for a dying partner. Uh, he challenged Ajodo uh, to present a documentary evidence of engagement as a consultant by the office of the AGF. Well, that's the conversation we're having tonight. And joining us to discuss this is a legal practitioner, Jide Ologun, and Kwanam Terence, a security expert. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice Great. You. Uh, uh, as much as this is a legal issue, of course, this is also a, a security issue because uh, there seems to be a threat to the life of the justice herself. So I'm going to start with you, Kwanam. Th th this story is no, I'm sure you're no stranger to this story because it has made headlines for weeks. Um, now some people have been apprehended and one is singing like a canary, in including the fact that he has tried to implicate the Attorney General of the Federation. And, and many of them are making claims that are very hefty. Uh, what does this even say in terms of the fact that they were, according to them, they're not necessarily security appraisers, but they were able to access the residence of, of, of a justice of the Federation. What does this say about the security of uh, highly placed personnel in this country? Well, I think uh, uh, there's complicity in the whole issue because uh, uh, those people who have had that audacity uh, to go and invade uh, the resident of that kind of a VIP, if they have not been involved before, and that is one. And then the confidence uh, uh, the lead suspect has placed on the uh, Attorney General of the Federation uh, still needs further investigation uh, to see uh, the level at which they have partnered together. And uh, the, the, the office address in Zone 6 uh, that has been also discovered to belong to a very uh, senior lawyer in this country is also another issue. So to me, uh, they, uh, what was paraded today was just uh, part of what we need to know of exactly what happened at that place and also uh, uh, goes uh, to show that uh, if it were successful, uh, maybe uh, us, some agencies, law enforcement agencies in our country might have taken responsibility to pick it from there. Uh, because maybe if uh, uh, the raid on the other justices too were not successful, nobody would have taken responsibility then because this has happened in this country uh, before, as embarrassing as it is, uh, it happened, and some certain people come out to take responsibility. Uh, but I think the outcry uh, that came in this particular situation from citizens of this country uh, trying to see uh, political motives into most of these invasions that are taking place on our judiciary was too embarrassing for them to dare again. And that is why this game is being played uh, to the point that we are today. 
uh, mm -hmm. because I am not, uh, I don't know the dynamics of the judiciary, uh, but to the layman, what we are made to understand on the street is that uh, the chief judge himself is sick, and uh, the mayor really as a person is supposed to have been acting, and then he needed to be embarrassed and humiliated uh, for someone else to have been in that place. It's a claim that I don't have proof to it. Uh, but by and large, I see that it's the failure of that invasion that is bringing about all this denial and next five years. Uh, but by the inter I have got that from the whole experience, I think the AGFC has something to answer and tell Nigeria. That's my take on that. This isn't the first time that judges' homes have been sacked. This is not the first time that um, certain people, especially security agents, have attempted to break into the homes of judges, not just in Lagos, uh, but in Rivers and I think uh, maybe Bauchi or so. Um, this has happened before. Uh, but, but then we see that, we noticed very early on that the EFCC, the police, even the uh, um, Attorney General had distanced himself. Many people had distanced themselves from, you know, all of this. But then there's, a, there's that question as to um, the exactness, the deliberateness, the information that they, they were armed with um, when they invaded, you know, the home uh, of the justice. It calls to question, of course, um, I do not know if the, the home of, of the justice was, you know, uh, whether she has security um, policemen um, assigned to her. I do not know that. But does that, again, I'm asking this question, does that not call to question our general security in this country? I ask because it's one thing to talk about the fact that we're dealing with banditry in the, south, uh, in the northwest. We're dealing with Boko Haram uh, in the northeast. And we're also dealing with uh, unknown gunmen in every other part of the country. But when it comes to the seat of the capital, uh, and, and this, is, this seems, she might not be the number one person when it comes to the judiciary, but she is, I think, number two, if I'm not mistaken. Does this not call to question everything that our security agencies have been doing? Yeah, the, uh, generally we have security situations in the country, but for this particular issue, I see a cartel that is operating around the area. And uh, some people that feel that it is only the people they bless uh, or anoint that can have stakes within the judicial systems because of whatever they are doing there. Uh, and so those people uh, had the audacity to go and obtain that stage one, if at all uh, it is genuine, because that too needs to be investigated uh, for the chief magistrate to have done that. And if we could listen to uh, uh, Statements that came during the parade, you could hear uh, what the press, the journalist that is amongst them, have said that they told him uh, that they were going to invade the property that was empty, but there were millions of dollars in it. So obviously, there was a lead report that gave him the confidence to follow them. And so maybe uh, there was a lot of deep deception around even some of the press people that followed uh, the operation. And that's why, they, so I think. I go completely with the committee, the NBA is insisting that the president should set up that must be independent, that the NBA must be involved, and uh, other independent-minded bodies to be involved, rather than the AG of himself setting the committee when he is a prime suspect in this issue. So I completely go with that. This issue is still under investigation. Yes, the, 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 the Supreme Court judge is supposed to be to have armed security personnel around her home, the way they begin to bring a search warrant with a lot of arms, including the military and next right there. Obviously, there will be an next to go and next right there for them to be able to have their way. But luckily for us this time as a country, it was not successful. And then we are beginning to hear all these confessions. And obviously, some people might have fallen victim of this cartel in the past that we didn't know, mm. uh, because maybe they have found what they had wanted at that time. And so it didn't come to this situation. But God has exposed them, and I think uh, it is for the uh, for the NBA to be able to help us defend this judiciary because we are completely losing it. Now, talking about the judiciary, let me come to you, Mr. Logan. Um, 
you, of course, you're an officer of the law here, uh, and I'm, I mean that you obviously are a lawyer. Um, so this obviously it affects your constituency directly. Uh, and what he's saying is that the judiciary needs help and needs saving, and that saving can only come uh, if the NBA stands its grounds. Yes, the NBA is pushing for you know um, uh, an unbiased investigation into this. So is the government of River State. So are members. Uh, of the National Assembly, because this seems to be a, a very major issue uh, uh, because of how you know it played out. But then I want to ask: many have uh, many people who have commented on this issue have said that maybe based on suspicion uh, that the men who are being paraded may not necessarily be the original people who staged the invasion, and these people may just be, for the want of a better phrase, the fall guys. What are your thoughts? Firstly, let me congratulate Honorable Justice Mary Ojili for escaping the long arms of death suspiciously because it could have turned out to be something else. And I'll be making reference to some precedents we have in the country. Recall also that the daughter of Chief Pashanoti, the elder state man, was assassinated and thereafter few suspects were arrested. Where's the case today? It has fizzled out. <clears throat> Don't also forget quickly that the former chief of ES staff, <clears throat> Alex Badi, was assassinated in this country. And then um, some were arrested, <clears throat> but the case is under the carpet somewhere as we speak. And several cases recall at a time when another set of gunmen <clears throat> were in River State to harass somebody who is a prominent figure in the NDDC project. It took Governor Wike to go down there to rescue the woman. And then um, <clears throat> this time around, we cannot even classify whether these are state actors or non-state actors, but there have been confessions of military men being in their midst. So do we now have private soldiers in Nigeria who are not in the employment of the government? And the ajodo of a man who claims to be consulting for the Attorney General of the Federation, how did he go to obtain the alleged warrant from the magistrate? There are several questions to ask here. And um, if you look at the Attorney General of the Federation himself, he's been in the eyes of some controversies recently, the $418 million uh, payment to the consultant to be deducted from the Paris fund, uh, uh, re reform. <clears throat> and so, and let me take us out of Nigeria a bit. Recall that recently there were allegations of sexual abuse against the governor of New York State, in the New York uh, in in the USA. And as we speak now, the man has resigned from office. Another governor is there. Do we have situations like that in the country? It's been paraded that Malami is highly influential with the president. And like we have brilliantly made reference this evening, these are issues touching on security. You can imagine what would have happened, what an embarrassment it would have been that the second in command in the Supreme Court of Nigeria got murdered. And if she were to be murdered, the same way we would approach the investigation. So here are allegations now rather than giving us rhetorics and then be speaking big grammar, then explain to Nigerians what your involvement is in all this. And don't also forget that many of these actions have gone under the carpet. At a time under the Eighth National Assembly, we woke up to the news that some gunmen, masked, went to besiege the National Assembly. And on investigation, orders from above. Who are these people above that are giving these orders? And don't let me quickly run away from the Supreme Court. You can recall also the drama that led to the removal of the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Walter Onohe. How ex party order was obtained on declaration of assets. At the end of the day, he was given a soft landing. And if he could be removed from office by virtue of those allegations, why was he not prosecuted? Have we? thrown to the dustbin the fact that the former acting chairman of EFCC uh, was removed based on allegations. And the same attorney general of the Federation was very active in that removal. 
So just, there are several issues. And yeah, but, but it calls the question also the role of uh, our judiciary uh, officers, including the NBA, and that's why I started with that question. Where does the NBA come in here? Because it's not enough for us to just go on the pages of newspapers or make press conferences or, you know, uh, talk about the issue. And you have mentioned so many issues that have been swept under the carpet. And you're making reference to um, the New York governor who stepped down. And this is, he's not the first. This is, a, this is a system that works in those parts, in those parts of the world where if you are under investigation, you step aside. But there is no precedence in this country. And I, I'm, I'm wondering why the, the NBA is hoping that that will start today. If it's the same attitude and just um, jaw-jawing and no actions, um, I'm wondering why they think that there's going to be some form of change or you know, a, a different kind of response to this issue. Correct me if I'm wrong. I must, I'm a bit I must pessimistic the, about I must this. The, yes, I must commend the Nigerian Bar Association that has expressed displeasure at what happened recently. But when the houses of some judges were invaded by state actors years past, what came out of it? Don't forget, when we talk about criminal allegations, it is the government that we prosecute. The, judi the judi judiciary is to provide the vehicle for that prosecution. And you have the defense. And if the those who should prosecute refuse to prosecute. And who are they? You know them. It's executive arm of government. And who is the Attorney General of the Federation answerable to? The executive arm of the government. So, and it's been paraded that he's highly influential in that in that region. Until this government, this regime wakes up to the need for good governance and accountability, then we may begin to imagine that we have fair play in how. Uh, and what if is, this government never is awake to that responsibility? Because it looks like from everything that we, you have said here and all the things on the writings on the wall, they may never come alive to that responsibility. So what do we do? Wait, um, uh, you know, on the wings and we, hope we, that some we, miracle we, we will have, happen? We, I mean, we, again, we, I'm we, wondering we, why would the government be investigating an issue where they have been alleged to be involved in? Shouldn't the government step aside on this issue? It should be the people versus the government, that, right? That is, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just explaining that we, we have been put in a box. We've always been advised, wait till the next election as electorates, as citizens, if you are not pleased with what is going on. But that is a breach of the fundamental principles of good governance. If you read Section 15, Subsection 5 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, it says that the government shall abolish corruption and abuse of office. But then, how, how can you claim there is an abuse of office if the, th those who are supposed to declare it so are reluctant or are comfortable with the abuse of office? Let me ask a simple question here. The same Attorney General of the Federation told the world that they have identified 400 sponsors of Boko Haram. And he proceeded to say that they will not name and shame them, but will prosecute them. In which court are they being prosecuted today? We are asked, in the UAE, four sponsors of Boko Haram have been prosecuted and convicted. What are we talking about? You see, so it, it, it's quite disturbing. But like I said, when we discuss matters like this, we must go to the presiding officer. And the presiding officer over this present regime is the president of Nigeria and the commander in chief of the armed forces, President Muhammad Buhari, whom I respect so much. And going by his body language and the perception we have, because perception is a very strong uh, barometer in public relations, it's as if he's not as bothered about these embarrassing circumstances that we have in the country. So where do you go from there? Mm. And people, agencies look up to the presiding officer. If today the National Assembly is asking that declare these bandits as terrorists, and the president decides not to declare them as terrorists, even though their activities reflect the activities of terrorists, where do we go, my sister? Where do we go, my fellow compatriots? These are issues that are plaguing our nation. These are serious issues. 
You can imagine, like I said when I started this conversation, what about if Honorable Justice Odili was killed? She would have gone into the list of victims. Don't forget that talking about insecurity in this country, Chibola Ige, the number one law officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, was assassinated until today. There is no head of tail concerning that case. Mm. So what, what are we talking about? Okay. What are we talking about? Let me let me go back to Kwan. We, we should all be worried. And section 14, subsection 2 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended says that the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. But now when that mandate is thrown into the air, what happens? Kidnapping, killings. Are you not worried? For example, well, in well, well, let, state, let, let, I, I'm sure I'm, every every single Nigerian who's watching this show now at the moment and all those who read the papers, of course, are wondering what the what, where we're going. So I'm going to push my next question to Quanem. Um, Quanem, the description of all that we've been discussing and all the detailed, um, you know, precedences that we've had of armed men, you know, going into houses of high placed judges and threatening their lives. Um, Makes me really wonder, and I'm going to um, try to use the best way to um, ask this question. This militarized system of government that we seem to be operating under the guise of a democracy, where does this lead us? Because, it's, again, he's saying that the hands of um, the, the judiciary seems to be tied because, again, it seems that the people who head the judiciary have questionable character. Um, and if the our law enforcement agencies also uh, have to, you know, do or obey the order, the last order, which is from a center, the center, and these people also are answerable to Mr. President or the presidency, then where does that leave us as a country? Is there ever going to be justice for people who disappear, people who were killed, um, no questions asked, the investigations never really happen. For example, there is a... Um, there is actually a magistrate who um, initially actually um, issued a controversial warrant. This warrant that he said he was misled to. Misled to by whom? Where is the investigation? Where is the investigation into all of these things? Because there has to be uh, some form of a trail that would lead us to maybe the kind of change that we're hoping for. So in terms of this and the security that we're facing now, where are we going? Well, I don't think it's an issue of the the judiciary yeah, uh, having people of questionable character. I have not taken time to look at the justices that their homes have been invaded. They are all Christians. And uh, it's part of the nepotist act of this government uh, trying to uh, uh, clamp on people who are not of their religion why, why do you uh, say so? Why, why do you think it's a religious the, attempt? If you look at all the judges that their homes have been invaded, they are all Christians. And they are operating with their Muslim counterpart. So is it that once you are a Muslim and you are a judge in this country, then you become a saint? And those are the questions. And uh, uh, is they are just climbing down on them to make sure that uh, they don't have a voice and they will have their way. Even the judge, the chief judge that we have today, uh, to me, even is the Mr. Pazan and that's why they're questionable to me. And, and just like uh, uh, the barrister is saying there, uh, uh, the level and manner, and uh, they had to push your nation out to be able to bring him in, and all of that, uh, it, it took the intervention of the, uh, uh, some members of the judiciary to protest uh, for the president of the customary uh, court of appeal to be uh, to be sworn in and next why that. So we are seeing these things and we know where they are headed. To. Where is and it so headed? Where is it headed? That's the question because the average Nigerian is wondering if this is where we are right now, where will we be in a few more years? On the judiciary and uh, that this government is pursuing because to me, every ju judicial officer that has been prosecuted has come from one section of our society, which is the Christian community. And I, I keep wondering why it is easy to be a saint within the judicial uh, system if uh, you are a Muslim. And so it's strange to me that uh, I already know 
that it is even very difficult for this government to be able to address issues of insecurity that has to do within the cold northern place where they are Muslims, but it's quite easy for them to handle the issues of security within the South. And so when you put all these things together, it still boils down to one thing that is a nepotism agenda that is being played out in this country. And it's quite unfortunate that we found ourselves in a situation where the governor will come out to tell you that since 2017, he has been begging the federal government to declare bandits as terrorists. The governor of Sukutu State, Kassina Zamfara, forum of speakers and next wife But it makes no sense to the government that has to do that. And it's just for you to declare these people as terrorists for the international community to be able to come in and assist you and bring technology, to be able to fool these characters out. But when it goes to the south, it is easy for them to go to foreign lands to arrest people like now the Tano and go to places like the Republic to be able to nab the likes of Igbo down and declare iPod terrorist groups. So when you put all these things together, it's just an agenda that is being played out. And it's quite unfortunate that we find ourselves in this mess. Wow. Finally, Mr. Logan, quickly, if this issue is pursued um, with all of the vigor and the uprightness, the unbiasedness that it needs, will this one way or the other pose a problem for the, all those concerned, even those who've been fingered, even those who've denied? That is led to the police investigation. You know, there are three qualifications or requirements in the criminal justice value chain. You need a thorough investigation, you need a diligent prosecution, and you need a committed judiciary. But in the absence of prosecution, what is the role of the committed judiciary? And that's why we should be worried that those who should be trusted with equity, those who should be trusted to implement justice, are themselves portraying not being reliable to carry out that assignment. I said earlier, we will be told that if you are not satisfied with that, then you wait till you vote again. Are we going to continue in this circle? You know, there are several instances, several examples. But let me quote, and uh, let me paraphrase what the founding father of the modern Singapore, Lin Kuan Yew, said, that they decided to do the right thing, and we continue to do the, and to the right thing. And if you look at where our country is now in the polity of nations, we cannot claim to even be better than we were in 1960 when we gained political independence. And I think those who are front thinking, developmental conscious in, in, in their approach to issues must be worried about this. And it's just a simple thing. We go to what we have in section 17 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended that says that the social platform for our coexistence will be the issue of justice, uh, equity and freedom. And All right. except we have justice, where everyone is respected as citizens, where we have the rule of law, where everyone is subject to the laws of the land, we may not make the desired progress. And I believe all these things are possibilities, but I take it back again to the table of the presidency. Okay. My dear president, sir, when you we leave office, go. what will your regime be remembered for? And on that note, I want to say God bless Nigeria. All right. Well, um, Jide Logun is a legal practitioner. Kwanam Terence is a security expert. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. And when we return, let's not forget that COP26 is winding down. But of course, war powers are taking steps to cut carbon emissions across cities in Africa, Asia and Latin America. What will be our step here in Nigeria when we return? We'll talk more about it.